Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to The Sanctuary. We got a new boat today. That means we're going to jump into a new topic. I'm still going to be Professor C, and we're still going to do some A&P lecturing, but specifically, we're going to get into the brain today and talk about how you get a brain, actually, the concept of cephalization or how to get ahead in life. So let's check it out. So we're about to dive into the central nervous system. And if you remember from our other talks, we're talking about the brain and the spinal cord specifically. Now we see a brain here all firing up very pretty like, um, but it doesn't really show us much detail. And if we do something like cut it open, like do a sagittal cut right down the middle and look at all the complexity inside, it looks like a pretty hard thing to tackle in a single talk. And that's certainly the case. So we're going to take this piece by piece. Uh, the first thing I want to deal with today is actually how you develop a brain. How do you go from a little ball of cells way back during development and develop this very complex system of neurons that we call the brain and the spinal cord? So that's what we're going to check out first here. Now, if I look at, say, a palm tree, for example, this obviously doesn't have a nervous system like we think of at all, nor does it have a brain or a spinal cord, right? Now, it might sound funny to think about that, but there's a cactus. There's a little protist guy called a volvox. Here's some flagellated bacteria. Here's a mushroom, which you would probably call a type of fungus. And here's another possibly type of fungus or a plant. It's kind of hard to tell, actually. Is that moss? Is that some kind of lichen or some kind of other thing that we're not really sure of? We know it's sitting on. It looks like a stump of a tree. But the point is, there's a lot of different life forms here, from a fungus to a protist to a bacteria to plants. None of these have a nervous system. None of these have a brain. So when did it develop? in evolutionary history? Well, fairly recently is the answer, but let's keep diving deeper here. Let's look at some animals now. And again, we're going by modern taxonomy, that is modern classification of life, based on many, many different things. And sponges, what you see here, would fall into kingdom animalia, the same kingdom that we belong into. Now, Sponges, of course, are very, very simple animals. They don't have a nervous system either, like we think of, nor do corals. They might be very pretty to look at, a big multicolored coral reef, but there's not a whole lot of thought going on here. Now, you can actually get a little bit more complex here and get into an animal such as a sea urchin, which has nice what we call radial symmetry. That is, it kind of looks like a ball. It has kind of a center part, and all the other parts grow from that center in a very symmetrical way uh, around either a circle idea or a spherical idea. And we call this radial symmetry. Now, you will find in starfish, sea urchins like has been shown, jellies and sea anemones that we do see complexity here as far as nerves go, but we don't see a brain yet. We don't see even a head yet. We really just see a body with different parts sticking out or hanging off from that central body. So we do have animals here, but we don't have nervous system yet. We need one more thing before we can proceed into the world of heads. And that is called bilateral symmetry. What we see here now in this type of animal is the left side and the right side are symmetrical. But the front, which is here on this rotifer, and the back are now markedly different. We don't have that radial symmetry anymore. We have bilateral symmetry. So we actually have now, for the first time in the animal kingdom, a head and the other end, which is not the head. You could call it the tail for now if you want. And you can see this in hydras. You can see this in body helmets that is flat worms. Look at his nice little eyeballs there in that little head of his. A very, very primitive, but a head indeed. There's an earthworm that you're familiar with. It's got a head and a tail. And there's a cute little axolotl looking at you with its head and its arms and everything else. And there's a galloping horse, which of course we know has a head and a tail, just like you. So once we've evolved into this concept of being bilaterally symmetrical, we can push very slowly, generation after generation, move neurons toward the head. 
This is known as cephalization, right? That root word cep or ceph referring to the head. So this is an evolutionary process in animals that do have this right side, left side symmetry and a front and a back. And over time, over generations, neurons have been pushed toward the anterior portion, the part that we call the head. And of course, the most complex example of this is what we call the human brain and how it forms very slowly. So here's an adult brain in this image, and let's get a little familiar with the big parts of it anyway for now. The cerebrum is that big pink wrinkled part that you always see preserved in jars in the science movies, right? Cerebrum is how you say that. In the back here, I'll kind of circle it so it stands out a little better. This little bulb hanging off down here is called the cerebellum. Yeah, unfortunately, they're nearly spell the same, and it does cause some confusion, but cerebrum is the big pink part up top that's wrinkled. Cerebellum is also wrinkled, but it hangs down below on the backside. Now, what you see here that I can arrow to is the brain stem. And if you could follow this outside of the occipital bone down the foramen magnum, it would at some point become the spinal cord. And there you're seeing a very good picture of what we call the central nervous system. This of course isn't all the parts, but it's showing the main parts that form the brain, cerebrum, cerebellum, brainstem, and the spinal cord. Now, of course, when you're a little ball of cells as an embryo, and then even as a fetus in utero, your brain certainly doesn't look like this. This is the brain of a fully formed adult. So how does it go from a few you know, cells to a hollowed out ball of cells? At what point do you say that you're developing a nervous system and how does it become the cerebrum, cerebellum, and brainstem? Well, it all has to do with these what are called embryological vesicles. Now, when you're a little tiny thing, you have just a tube and I'm gonna put in tube for neural tube. Now we can get into notochords if you want to study something more primitive than this, but I'm going to start here at the neural tube. And this would be a tube that forms during development that pretty much wrong, runs along the length of your backside, right? And at some point during development, this long slender neural tube will bulge out. It will balloon into these three lumps like you see in this picture right here. And these are known as the primary vesicles. And there are three of them, primary brain vesicles. Now, of course, this is going to happen at the very, very anterior end at the part of the body that will eventually become the head. And we call these regions three different things. They all end in encephalon. So the first one where I'll put a P here, this largest one, the most the one in front, pro, right? Meaning the beginning. Pros encephalon, often called the forebrain, because pros encephalon gets a little wordy to say over and over and over. The little middle part there is called the mesencephalon, and mes, of course, one of the roots for middle. This is the middle of these bulges, and it is often called the midbrain. At the back, right, we have the rhombencephalon sometimes called the hindbrain. In some books, especially in Europe, they call this the end brain. And of course, down below here, anything below the rhombencephalon would be the spinal cord that eventually would leave the skull and drop down the back. So these are the three primary vesicles. Of course, that brain that we saw just a moment ago did not look like this. So there must be some more differentiation that occurs over time. So let's check that out. Okay, taking another look here at this little wormy individual. It kind of looks like you and a lot of other animals when they're in their embryological state. You can see, again, the front part of this forebrain called the prosencephalon, the blue part on the little worm guy. We have the middle part, the mesencephalon, the midbrain there in pink on this guy. And then in green, we have the back, we have the rhombencephalon. And then dangling down behind it in yellow, we have the spinal cord, a very good way to see how this would be developing as you are an embryo. But let's get into some of the secondary vesicles now. All right, so remember we have prosencephalon, the first bulge, the mesencephalon is the middle bulge, and then the rhombencephalon is that third bulge before we drop down into the spinal cord. Now on the right, we can see that the prosencephalon is actually divided into two different bulges. The mesencephalon has stayed the same, and the rhombencephalon has also split into two 
types of differentiated bulges. So let's look at the names of these now. The prosencephalon will divide into the larger tel encephalon and the smaller di encephalon. And as you continue to develop, the tel encephalon will kind of surround the di encephalon, almost eating it up and swallowing it inside. Now, you will call the tel encephalon later on the cerebrum, that big pink wrinkle por portion of the brain. The diencephalon remains a structure called the diencephalon. Structures like the thalamus and the hypothalamus will form this diencephalon. Now, again, the mesencephalon will stay the mesencephalon. So the midbrain is the midbrain is the midbrain. That's what I usually tell my students. The mesencephalon remains the mesencephalon and becomes what we call the midbrain later on. Now the rhombencephalon will split into two again, differentiated bulges. We have a metencephalon, which will become the cerebellum on the outside and the pons on the inside. And we have a myelencephalon, which will at some point become the medulla oblongata, sometimes just referred to as the medulla. And then, of course, we'll drop out of the skull and we'll have the spinal cord down below here. Okay, so five different bulges here in the secondary differentiation. Here's another look of that if you want to get into the picky parts, which is on those sticky little exams that you see in A&P. So we've got our NT, I'll put our neural tube over here, and then here's our three primary bulges, and here's our secondary bulges out here. And here's what they will become when you finally get that full adult brain that actually doesn't stop forming until you're about 19 years old. So let's remind ourselves of some of these structures. Primarily, we have the prosencephalon, in the middle, the mesencephalon, at the back, the rhombencephalon, and always remember the spinal cord will be the last part of this story. As we see a secondary differentiation, we get the tel encephalon and the di encephalon. As an adult, remember the tel encephalon will become the cerebrum, both the cerebral hemispheres, the outside layer called the cerebral cortex. You see that in brown in the picture there, and what we call the basal nuclei, structures that we'll look at more in depth later. Now the diencephalon will remain the diencephalon, but it is actually more of a triencephalon if you want to think about it. It's the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and a structure known as the epithalamus, sometimes called the pineal gland. It also, you might see the diencephalon related to the retina, although we're going to kind of steer away from that idea later on. The mesencephalon, remember, the midbrain is the midbrain is the midbrain. So mes remains mesencephalon, and it will be the midbrain. The rhombencephalon will split into two different bulges. We have one of them called the metencephalon. This will become the pons on the inside and the cerebellum on the outside and that kind of that orange color forming on the outside. And then the myelencephalon will become the medulla or the MO, or the medulla oblongata. And then down at the bottom, of course, we have the spinal cord at the end of the story. And that's a pretty good summary of these vesicular differentiations that happen as you go from a small little ball of cells to a fully formed adult brain. All right, this is the adult developed brain. And you can see this cerebrum and diencephalon. That came from the prosencephalon, remember? I said that this big pink wrinkle portion here would swallow up this diencephalon. And here you see this thalamus and hypothalamus and the pituitary gland hanging down from it. Now, remember, the midbrain is the midbrain is the midbrain, the mesencephalon. The way I used to see it is you can see these two little notches back here, these two bulges that make a B. And if I can put an M here, I can see MB. I can see midbrain. So there's the mesencephalon. As we get to the rhombencephalon, remember, we're going to have a lot of differentiation. The cerebellum will form on the back part of it, and the pons will form there in the front part of it. It kind of looks like it's pregnant. And I used to remember the pregnant pons, and that would help me keep it straight how to figure out where that is. Right below there, we have another little bulge called the medulla oblongata. And then, of course, when we leave the skull through the foramen magnum and the occipital bone, the medulla oblongata becomes the spinal cord. All right, I hope that helped you understand how the brain differentiates from a little tiny ball of cells to an adult brain. Thanks for watching it all the way to the end if you did, and please check out some more videos in my series if you want to learn more about A&P. See you for the next one. Bye-bye.